So this is a quick video that I'm going to make to demonstrate how the electron transport chain works. And the electron transport chain is actually found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Here I've just drawn the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and the intermembrane space between the, between the two as we know that the mitochondria is a double membrane bound organelle. Now the general idea is that you have NADHs. NADHs are high energy molecules that are produced in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycles. And they carry electrons and they bring them to the electron transport chain and pass these electrons along the electron transport chain to eventually produce ATP. Now to specifically go into this process, they have four there are four complexes through which this happens. Complex one, two, three, and four. The names of these complexes are complex one is called NADH dehydrogenase. My writing is not the best, but complex one is NADH dehydrogenase. Complex two is called succinate dehydrogenase. I know that sounds familiar and it probably should be considering that is a enzyme that is used in the Krebs cycle to produce fumarate. And we'll get to that later. Dehydrogenase. Complex 3 is called cytochrome C oxyreductase. I'll just abbreviate it cytochrome C oxyreductase. And complex 4 is lastly called cytochrome C oxidase. I'll just say the same thing, but instead I'll put oxidase here. Okay, so to start off, you have your NADH molecule. We're only going to consider the movement of one NADH molecule for simplicity's sake. So you start off with NADH. NADH comes and binds to your first complex, and this actually causes the uptake of two electrons from NADH, and it produces NAD+. It gets oxidized. Now, complex one consists of three important uh, subunits. The first one is the flavin mononucleotide. The second one are just iron-containing proteins, and the last one is iron-containing sulfur proteins. I'll annotate it that. So, the electrons initially travel and bind to the flavin mononucleotide. Then, they pass down a chain to the iron-containing proteins, and they continue on and stop when they come and bind to the iron-containing sulfur proteins. That's actually sulfur. As soon as this binds to the iron containing sulfur, another enzyme is involved. involved. This enzyme is called coenzyme Q. In other words, ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is actually a membrane, uh, an enzyme that is not membrane bound. So it freely floats in the intermembrane space. So what happens is this enzyme comes and picks up these two electrons. And as it picks up these two electrons, it also takes two hydrogen ions and it binds selectively to both of them which turns ubiquin uh, ubiquinone into ubiquinol it gets oxidized I'm just going to use abbreviations here because it takes a little too long to write the whole thing out ubiquinol and then the ubiquinol now that it's reduced it actually travels all the way to mem to cytochrome sorry not cytochrome to complex 3 yes I know that I skipped complex 2 but Complex 2 is actually independent of the other three complexes, and I'll get back to that after. So complex 3 here is, again, composed of very important subunits. The first subunit is, looks something like this. The drawing might not be that accurate, but this is a general idea, and it's called cytochrome B. It also has more iron-containing sulfur proteins, and the most important subunit is actually a a self sorry a, a cytochrome C. The cytochrome C is probably the most important part of this complex. As what happens is is that the ubiquinol comes 
and binds to the cytochrome C. The cytochrome C then takes the two electrons that it's carrying for itself and it turns the ubiquinol into ubiquinine. So now that it has these two electrons, the cytochrome C, which is also a protein that is free to move about, it's not membrane bound, it then travels to cytochrome, sorry, I keep saying cytochrome, uh, to complex 4. And then complex 4, the subunits are a little bit more simple. It's 1, 2, and 3. The names aren't that important, but it's more so the function of the names that matter. And the functions of the first subunit are actually to produce ox uh, to produce water, and that'll make more sense as I reduce this down a bit. So the first part is, or the first subunit is composed of alpha and beta subunits, and these alpha and beta subunits is actually what matters. What happens is the electrons from the cytochrome C are transferred along the alpha and beta subunits and they pass through and bind to a single oxygen molecule so technically half an oxygen if you want to look at it in terms of molecular formula because oxygen is diatomic so and it so it takes these two electrons and it, along with it couples the hydrogens two hydrogens and that's how you get water as a byproduct and because the terminal electron acceptors where the electrons are taken at the end is oxygen this is why oxygen is considered the terminal electron acceptor I hope that's clear now there is more to this because I'm sure you're wondering how on earth is ATP synthesized now what happens is the way through which ATP synthesizes is the, through the movement of hydrogen ions. Now, as you see, I've, just, I've instructed how the electrons move in the chain, but the key point is that in complex one, as these electrons are moving, complex one also acts to pump out four hydrogen ions from the matrix. Then complex two, sorry, complex three also proceeds to pump out four hydrogen ions. And lastly, complex three pumps out two hydrogen ions to total ten hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space. Now, I'll just draw a crude diagram of what complex five or ATP looks like. It's kind of like it looks like this. The structure isn't too important, but what you need to know is it can spin. Okay, so what happens is the general idea is hydrogen ions pass through this and make ATP. But there's a little bit more complexity to this than just that. What you need to understand is that the ATP synthase actually consists of more subunits. There's actually an F not subunit and an F1 subunit. The F1 subunit, not too much of a big deal. It just consists of a bunch of alpha, beta, gamma subunits. It's not the biggest concern. But the F not subunit consists of alpha and beta subunits that are a big deal. Because what happens is the hydrogen ions bind to the alpha and beta subunits here and when it binds to the alpha and beta subunit it actually causes the whole F0 to turn and this turning actually results in ADP which is inside the matrix here to get phosphorylated and I'm sure we know what happens when ADP gets phosphorylated you get ATP and this is through the movement of all the hydrogen ions and we know that there's 10 hydrogen ions in order to turn the ATP synthase once to produce one ATP you need four hydrogen ions so 
we can do some simple math here and as we know that 1 NADH is equivalent to 10 hydrogen ions that means 2.5 ATP are produced for every NADH molecule and since you run through two NADHs per cycle for example from glycolysis you produce two NADHs that is equivalent to 5 ATP but since we started off with 10 NADHs simple math you end up with a net 25 ATP produced and this is not considering the other methods with the, which ATP is produced. This is why oxidative phosphorylation is very efficient in terms of generating ATP. It actually generates 38. But there's other mechanisms through which that happens. But this is the general process through which oxidative phosphorylation works. Now, I know I said that I would come back to um, complex 2. Complex 2, the general idea is it's very similar. Complex 2 was responsible for the same thing but instead of NADH you have FADH2 from the reduction in the Krebs cycle when you turn um, succinyl-CoA to, uh, to when you turn succinate to fumarase you use FAD and it becomes FADH2 right the FADH2 gives its electrons to here two electrons to the second uh, complex and again you have your iron containing sulfurs it travels to the iron containing sulfurs and it's picked up by coenzyme Q and it gets transported to the third complex where it's taken in by ubiqu uh, by cytochrome C and the rest of the process the same way that's where the other extra ATP comes from because it's not just the NADH is going through lots of electron carriers go through this process but the NAD NADH and the FADH2 are the main ones that are discussed generally and that pretty much sums it up in terms of the explanation. I hope this helped. It was kind of messy looking, but I hope that worked out. Thanks.